Hi all, so mm, today we come back on a chapter of early medieval history that I like particularly because um, I dedicated um, several time of my studies about it and um, I'm talking about Longobard history um, which um, I'm, I'm always glad to, 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 to talk about not just because of my interest but also because uh, as far as, mm, as I see, um, <coughs> it's um, a topic that is very rarely discussed um, and that hasn't really, you know, um, a great spread in, 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 in popular culture. Uh, very few people know who the Longbirds were. The few ones who know about them <coughs> generally fall into this idea of the, the, the brutal barbarians that, you know, slaughter and pillage it. Um, but it's really another case, and um, as I did on another video about longbirds that I, um, I, I really uh, urge <laughs> you to, to, to look, um, to watch, um, because it's very interesting, um, and I'm glad how it turned out. Um, you know, mm, please go look at that and, and try to understand, you know, how... Um, how really important the Longbirds were in European history and how culturally influential they were overall um, even if they ruled f um <coughs> practically only for two centuries in Italy hmm? and uh, and today I would like uh, you know Longbird history is quite wide for for um, um, the people who, who, who know it, uh, what it's about. And today I would like to discuss, um, as you read from the title, about um, the religious history of the Longbirds, which doesn't mean it's all about religion or, or beliefs. I personally find them quite interesting, especially in this passage that I'm that I am emphasizing <coughs> the passage from paganism to Arianism to Catholicism, but it's mainly a uh, political history because religion uh, at that time was, you know, played, especially by the elites, uh, in a very political way, and 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 they, you know, lo the religious Longobard history is. Um, in general, uh, a, an important part of the um, history of the uh, Germanic uh, Aryan kingdoms that <coughs> that uh, were created in in the Latin and largely Catholic world at the time uh, in the mi migration era. Um, and uh, it's, I believe, one of the most stimulating. Uh, we can say that every um, Germanic people that settled into the lands, former lands of the, of the empire, uh, became to be um, Christian, obviously. Uh, some certain times uh, at an early age, certain times later, and uh, each one of them retained its own characteristics, because obviously, you know, the, the local um, situation was, was different in each case. <coughs> And, uh, and Longbird history, in this sense, offers um, a very progressive um, path uh, of the, you know, uh, of, the, of Longbird culture into this problem of, you know, adapting to the uh, religion of uh, the local population that they had conquered I in Italy. Um, <coughs> and um, and I think the, the origins of the Longbirds are quite interesting at this point, but I think we will start from you know where the when they arrived in Italy. Um, the Longbirds arriving in Italy were um, formerly Aryan, which means this, as probably you know, this um, heresy of Arianism that was um, um, you know um, a peculiar. Um, belief that had spread uh, very largely among the um <coughs> the um, um the, the germanic peoples um and um um which asserts that essentially um jesus christ um is um uh, um 
as a, as a sort of more um, a divine uh, entity uh, over, you know, his um, um, human nature. Um, and this was, you know, um, you know, theologically speaking, obviously it was an her a heresy because uh, the uh, Nishan uh, Council, the, the first um, ecumenic council of Christianity, had been, uh, mm, and we're talking about the beginning of the fourth century A.D., had been called exactly to um, to to banish this uh, this heresy that was very widespread at the time. It was spreading, in fact, among the Germanic populations that were were. Um, or increasingly in contact with the Roman, the Roman world, and you can argue that um, it was spread among the Germans because it was um, something more intelligible for them than you know what the Christian um, uh, doctrine uh, was uh, explicitating. You know, for the Christian doctrine, um <coughs> in, in 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 Jesus there are two natures. Uh, the 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 uh, obviously the uh, divine one, but also the um, the the human one, and these are equal. Mm -hmm. So the Germans were instead, through Arianism, um, 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 they were essentially pushing for a much more divine-like god. Mm -hmm. Arius, uh, from which the term Arian. Um, uh, comes uh, was um, uh, was a um, a Christian presbyter, an ascetic and priest coming from Egypt, and uh, you might wonder why the Germans got these heresies. Well, simply because the um, you know the the theological debate uh, in the Constan from the Constantinian times onwards. So, when the empire um, um, allowed. Um, Christianity as a as a rightful um, belief and eventually became became the official uh, religion of the Roman state at the end of the fourth century. Uh, all these beliefs were, you know, highly uh, debated everywhere in the empire, and uh, and there were very influent um, very influent figures coming and very highly educated figures coming from the Romano Hellenistic world. That incidentally even rose to power within the same imperial court at Constantinople. Several Roman emperors were Arians, so you can understand how um, this heresy was quite easily, you know, intelligible from even, you know, <coughs> the other side of of the the border, let's say. Um, and and the Germans were, um, you know, becoming even part of the same empire. Uh, with the, um, due to the migrations and the much more intense relations, an increasingly uh, intense relation uh, with the Roman authorities. So this doctrine probably was taken by the Germans, as I was saying, because it was simpler to understand. I mean, um, I can't say the Germanic peoples were a primitive people, uh, were a primitive uh, entity at that time. Surely the Germans had their own identity, their own beliefs, which were, which were also quite, um, you know, poetic and 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 very sensitive. But you know, in front of the uh, in front of theology, in front of monotheism, it was very difficult for these people to really understand what what that was really about, and and they preferred to see, you know, that um, idea of Christianism that. Christian doctrine that best fitted to them initially, and probably seeing this idea of Jesus Christ being more of a, of a completely God, the divine figure, God-like divine figure, uh, they decided to adopt Arianism and to refuse um, the uh, Nishan dogma that these uh, that is still at the base of of, of the Christian uh, doctrine today. Um, that eventually became prevalent even um, among the Germans when where they settled in, in the lands of the empire, a, as we will be seeing with the Longbirds. However, this is um, a sort of simplistic explanation, um, or better, it doesn't take into consideration the political meaning that adopting Arianism uh, had for the Germans that uh, were relating themselves with the empire. Because the point 
was not really, you know, uh, the fact of adopting uh, a, a Christian belief. Because, you know, what did um, objectively the gods, especially when they still lived from the other side of the Roman frontier, cared about Christianizing themselves? Um, probably they didn't, you know, the the, Austro uh, the, the the Gothic kings didn't even care about that much. And they probably still retained pagan beliefs why even after having accepted this um this christianization but their interest was um not a passive one not the idea that you know that there were christian missionaries uh trying to convert them and they would some way you know soften up um through their through their work and becoming christian it was a much more uh, active policy from from the german side and it basically was needed to be accepted as peers in a certain way. Uh, it's a big word for because the um, the Romans never never accepted, uh, you know, that they felt to be the, the emperors of the world, and the Germans were just some of the peoples that inhabited this world. But at least from a diplomatical and broadly political point of view, the fact that the Germans would at least and their elites and their kings would mm, Chris be Christian. <laughs> would make them more presentable you know it gave um it took away a, a reason of um of contrast of attrition with them in in a in a political <coughs> and diplomatical seat uh, and and at that point you might think the germans could have chosen um the catholic doctrine right away um as like the the um the romans had decided uh, at at nicaea um but um they didn't because they thought that arianism could become a symbol of their different um cultural nature compared to the romans the germans doesn't matter how you know you know, backwards in, in in certain aspects, at least compared to the Romans, who were still at that time, they always thought to be superior to the Romans. Uh, the Germans had this very strongly rooted mm, warrior uh, ethics, for which you know they they were the only uh, the only people to be courageous, uh, like. Um, in the Strategicon uh, you, you of the uh, of the sixth century, you can read, you know, this idea that as Germans they were the best of all peoples, at and and, and that um, therefore they they couldn't be equated to any other one, not even the Roman ones. The Germans never said we want to be as much as the Romans. They always felt that they were better than the Romans, which was reciprocated because definitely the Romans didn't think to be worse than the Germans. But at a certain point, the problem was that <laughs> and the Roman Empire was uh, taken o over, at least um, mo mm, most of um, its um, dominions were eventually uh, ruled by Germanic peoples that had uh, began to settle there. So uh, this passage was deeply felt, and especially in the early Middle Ages, the Germans uh, recalled, and it's very interesting to see also, relatively to the Longobards, how that was felt in, in ninth century Italy. I mean, the idea that northern Italians like uh, Liutprand of Cremona mm, believed that he was a Lombard and a Longobard in his mind, um, had a, a, a great contempt toward the Romans, um towards the Byzantine Emperor in that case, because that is written in, in a work of Lutbrand that incidentally is a very Longobard name. Uh, one of the greatest Longobard or the greatest uh, Longobard king uh in um in history was Lutbrand. And Lutbrand of Cremona still while being, you know, still, you know, we can't say an, an Italian in many ways, he still believed that he was a German that as a Lombard he was still a Longobard and that he despised the Romans and we're talking about the ninth century and obviously we have to understand him also under the light of the fact that at that time he was writing for the Ottonians that were a Saxon dynasty bec um, ascending to the uh, imperial dignity of, of the Roman Empire from their own perspective being um, Emperor of, of the West, you know, Emperor of the Romans um so um 
this was so rooted at that time. You can understand how you know uh, strong it was at the times of the conversion, the first conversions of the Germans to Arianism. And um, um, so Arianism was chosen as an heresy to a sort of um, counterposition to Roman Catholicism. The Germans said, the Romans are Catholics, okay, we become Christian to appease them in, in a certain way, but we don't choose Catholicism, we choose Arianism, and we carry that out. Um, um, and, and therefore, you, you can understand how strongly political Arianism became. Because basically, almost all the um, the Germanic peoples of the migration era, except perhaps for the Franks and the Anglo-Saxons, um, they converted first to Arianism in, uh, and then to and eventually to Catholicism. Um, the Franks and the Anglo-Saxons became directly Catholics from paganism. For also in that case for for very peculiar reasons and that have uh, to be explained and not last for instance in the case of the Franks that uh, which is not the first uh, reason but definitely important one that they felt themselves a Catholic uh, Catholics as I in opposition to the Goths that were ruling at that time Italy and Spain and that therefore were their enemies at that time and also because you know the, their ally was the Byzantine Empire, so mm, they they prefer to 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 take on themselves directly this Catholicism. Also, because local policy would force them to do because Gaul had a very strong Catholic um, uh, clergy at that time, so they necessarily had to to appease them as well. Um, so um what I think is very interesting um in the in the history of the Longobards is however that uh, while the gods and other peoples uh, like the Burgundians or the um Alamanni um had uh, basically been well I'm not sure about these two peoples but for go the gods it's sure you know the gods had been um, um, Christianized by the same Roman missionaries, mm -hmm. so they they kind of drank from the um, the 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 uh, the the spring <laughs> of uh, of at least of this very highly cultural um, theological um, uh, tradition. Even though they eventually chose, as we've seen, to become uh, er heretics from from the Catholic point of view. Um, the Longobards, who lived in Central Europe for, s for centuries and were very far from the Roman world before entering into it, were actually converted to Christianism exactly through the same, uh, through other Germanic peoples. From the same gods, seemingly, even if we don't have certainty about this, but there is you know, evidence to suggest that Longobards at a certain point, but it's not very well documented. We 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 were just making a, um, a theory out of this. They met the gods that were already Aryan, and they told the Longobards what it was about. And 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 from a certain time onwards, that we we even failed to understand. Even the same Longbirds became Aryan. At least their elites chose, and they had no king at that time. They chose to, you know, show this superficial Christianization, especially when they moved into Pannonia, that is roughly today's Austria, and they began to be very close to the Mediterranean world, and um, especially with the with Byzantine Illyria, so a region that was very close to them and that um, forced, um, you know, with Byzantine presence forced them to, to enter into the uh, diplomatical relation uh, with, the, uh, with the Roman Empire. Um, so, if we can say that even the same gods um, who were the mostly and, and firstly Christianized Germanic peoples weren't probably 
that deeply Christianized and they still retained many pagan beliefs, you can imagine in the middle of, of Central Europe in, in, si in 6th uh, century AD, you know, how strong could be, <laughs> uh, you know, the degree of Christianization of a people that was converted in turn by this same um, Aryan gods. I mean, the Longobards really were really um, very, very superficially Christianized. And, uh, and, and when, when they um, migrated into Italy, crossing the Alps, um, their Christianism was almost non-existent. Um, there were some, you know, spots of, of, of Christianity here and there. Um, and, um, and, but when they came into the Italian Peninsula, they still retained quite evidently, and we know that from art, from, from even documental sources in a certain measure, very strong um, and ancestral uh, beliefs um, of, of their own um, pagan uh, pagan religion um, and they weren't seemingly even so much bothered to change their mind I mean there was no enormously s strong contrast with the local population regarding to this um, and we will be seeing why um, and this is very important because um, um, the, the Longbirds were a people that had a Vona Vodanic religion so they believed in the, uh, you know, that they had been adopted by Odin, or Bodan, as he was called at that time, in a very early age, that seemingly was um, dates even to 100 BC. The Longobards were some of the most ancient Germanic peoples that made it through the migration era. Many others were, you know, they lost their uh, tribal ethnonym. And Longobard was one a was a um, was a name that derived from uh, the fact that they had long birds, which was um, an attribute that was often uh, said to Bodan himself, who granted um, his military protection over the longbirds, uh, who um, recalled this legend of theirs as a um, as a people's um, myth, you know, the idea that in order to be a Longobard you had to be Bowden's son in, in a certain way. Um, and, um, and this belief was very strongly rooted into, into their culture and they wouldn't give up, so they wouldn't give it up, you know, just because someone else told them to. Um, and um, um, however, um, you know, s certain events occurred at this point because the Longobards migrating into Italy were very few compared to the uh, local um, population. Uh, the Longobards actually put in motion one of the largest um, group of people of the migration era. We don't know exactly how much they were when they migrated into Italy, also because there were other peoples coming with them. Not as mm, peoples as such, but uh, f a very few people know that uh, w the when the Longobards migrated in Italy there were a lot of Saxons. Uh, because the Longobards originally came from the areas that was eventually called Saxony, because it was conquered by by eventually by the Saxons when the Longobards moved and they had been in good relation with the Saxons and, and seemingly 20,000 Saxons came while migrating to Italy. At a certain point the Longobards told them, okay, now we have conquered Italy, you have to become our subjects. And the Saxons said, hell no, because we're Germanic freemen. And they came back to Saxony <laughs> and this is a nice story. But um, the Langobard people was quite ethnically mixed. We, we know that there were a lot of, even of, of Latin uh, people among them, because when uh, the Langobards had gone into Pannonia, there was definitely a Romanized population there. There were a lot of Iranic people, which means Sarmatians and other peoples of the steppes, even of Turch, uh, Turchic stock. 
even though I, I still believe they were dominantly Germanic in, in, uh, in part and, and surely culturally speaking because um, even this religion was a fundamental part of their identity and even if they had included people that came from very uh, diverse ethnical background um, this group has still retained a very strong and unequivocally Germanic character from uh, a, a national point of view we can say a bit anachronistically so that tells you how you know their culture was strongly rooted as uh, as we were saying when they came into Italy we think there were roughly 100,000 I think it's a good um, estimation um, there were however still very very few compared to the local Italian population Italy was extremely densely, densely populated in spite of all the devastation of the Greek Byzantine war and of the uh, plague that had hit um, during and after uh, that disaster a and therefore there was an evident problem of the fact that you know this um, you know Germanic background couldn't hold on the long run and the same um, Longbirds probably didn't make uh, a great resistance because they so mm, I mean immediately intermarried with the local population and even though they still believed to be Longobards even when you know they were ruling uh, maybe already descending from local Italians they began to change uh, their spiritual uh, beliefs um, uh, from from the bottom of, of society and this is something we, we don't see very clearly we simply know that, um, and this is very important, I believe, that uh, that probably, um, uh, you know, in when when we call these people mm, pagan or polytheists, first of all, we we should, mm, you know, um, we 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 should better criticize these names, um, but we we are giving a sort of monotheistic judgment to them because only monotheists um, are calling our people polytheists. A polytheist wouldn't consider himself a polytheist because in his own world uh, it, it's normal that there are more gods, more divinities and therefore he doesn't even need to conceive of the world in a different way. So we can say that the passage, the, the, the progressive um, Christianization of the Longobards didn't pass out of terrible religious struggles not at all but it's even it's it's very well seen even from Langobard jewelry art and symbolism uh, broad lament that um, the Langobards simply as polytheists um, associated the Christian God mm, uh, together with all the others you know he there was a coexistence of multiple beliefs at once and this is what it normally happens you know it's not that these longer birds all of a sudden you know were converted and they abandoned their fate no they would um, progressively being always more strongly Christianized and Italy was one of those regions of Europe that you know in, in medieval history were the most intensely Christianized without you know many many problems there, there were ar areas of Germany that probably remained pagan in practice until even the, the modern age um, Italy was immediately so the, the the world passage was was completed over the centuries um, in Italy without any religious struggle and we know that quite clearly from the sources it was just progressive uh, you know uh, passage from this group of beliefs that were put together Christian pagan um, etc um, probably even with a very relative we're very simple Christian belief we don't we don't have to think that the, mm, the average person of, of a, a Christian kingdom in the early Middle Ages was so well educated in religious matters to to um, you know to to fully understand the Christian doctrine. It was just something formal in many ways. 
Um, and, and eventually, you know, that became with low middle ages, especially something much more, you know, it was a much more um, catechism. People began to, to, to read more frequently, to, to read especially Holy Scriptures, and therefore that came by itself, you know, I mean, the full Christianization as, as such. Um, and, um, and however, um, we, we know uh, relatively few about that. We, we, we normally see that in art. Longbird Heart is fascinating. You can see that even before the Carolingian conquest, these Longbirds retained as a form of pride and of identitarism these motives and and images and view of the world that, that weren't that different from the one of the Germanic world that they came from. Also because, you know, northern Italy was quite close to Germany uh, at that time. You know, certain areas of the northeast especially were quite uh, quite strongly Germanized even during the, the low Middle Ages. So, you know, the, you can argue that the world the Longobards had come from was relatively far and 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 for for germanic peoples inhabiting and and going searching for fortunes or employ um uh as mercenaries uh in the mediterranean world it was pretty common in this uh era to to i don't know being born in say denmark and then you know uh, going to be a um a soldier for constantinople fighting in armenia against the persians for instance and then when your s duty was ended, you might come back in Scandinavia, uh, in the Jutland in that case with Denmark. Um, and, and, and the Germans quite strongly retained their, that memory of their origins, and, and probably lo for the Longbirds it, qui it was quite easy to do so. However, we have to talk about the elites, because as we have seen, it was the elites that had to deal instead with more pressing problems. And, 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 and you know, the Longobard elites really did a lot to, to make the Longobard people survive in that particular environment that was central and northern, well, also southern Italy at that time, because they were basically surrounded from one side by the Byzantines, from the other, well, uh, the other one from the Franks. Uh, they were quite weak initially, because they, were, they weren't they were united on the same kingdom. The elites decided to create a kingdom, to elect a king, and to wage war um, as a unique uh, group, and uh, at least with northern Italy that that succeeded. Essentially, northern Italy and Tuscany was the the you know the the mm, were were under uh, a unique political direction at least against the Byzantines from a military point of view. And the problem of religion, however, was very important because the Longobards had um, <laughs> had got um, in a bit of a mess because they had chosen. Uh, the very core of the uh, former uh, of the of the empire to go settle themselves at a very few distance from from Rome, and and therefore th that was a land that required them to necessarily deal with religious affair with a great understanding of the world political situation of the Mediterranean and you know this um, use of religion from for um, political gaming, essentially. Um, and, uh, it, and it's between, let's say, the, the 6th and the si uh, 7th century um, that um, then the Longobards became to be so, um, you know, mixed with the local population and becoming, uh, you know, start to, to thinking as one with the the local population and, and identifying themselves as, as such that they and, and, and they're indefinitely feeling this very strong influence of Catholicism because local population was all Catholic or at least in, in very large part at that time um, that they began to, to accept the idea of converting from Arianism to Catholicism you can argue that Arianism in this had a very little play, after all, or at least a very um, scarce uh, cultural impact. It, it might have been 
politically um, instrumental at the beginning, but as we've seen, you know, it doesn't seem the Longbirds to have taken, uh, to have changed radically their beliefs. They remained largely pagan even when they were Aryans. So eventually they they passed mm, quite directly into Catholicism. How did this happen? Formally, well, it formally happened under the uh, uh, the kingdom of uh, King Agilulf. Agilulf was one of the most important Longobard kings. That is often remembered for the uh, for his conversion to Catholicism. He was originally Arian. He was the Duke of Turin. Um, he was chosen as king essentially by the Longobard nobility, but with the consensus of the uh, widow ki uh, queen at the time still re reckoning who was the Bavarian Theodolinda who had become queen of the Longobards by marrying the king uh, Longobard king Authory who was Arian in fact and um, and the Bavarians this is very important the Bavarians uh, who were even north of the Alps so theoretically speaking they also lived in Central Europe instead weren't Aryans but Catholics, or at least um, at their court of this, um, you know, the Bavarians were not a kingdom, they were more of a dukedom or some kind of, um, you know, even, they're not even really, you know, mm, easily identifiable as a, ethnically as a people, because seemingly that Mm, it was much more of a sort of a confederation, but with very weak power, so after all, it was important. Uh, it was more of an emanation of the, of the Franks, as far as we know. However, they still retained s certain similarities with Longobards, if anything, for the language. Uh, Bavarian today is still very similar to what it, um, uh, it could have been Longobard at a certain point, even uh, if Longobard was a bit different. Longobard is an extinct language today, but it's, it seems that s the southern Germans um, today have still many, um, you know, share still very similarities with uh, the, uh, linguistically speaking, with the ancient Longobard tongue, because these were Germans that came from the Elbe, and, and therefore they had a common background. Um, and, um, and the Bavarians, however, were Catholic, you know, the, the, at least the Bavarian elites uh, were Catholic. So the Princess Theodolinda, when she was married to the um, King of Italy, of Longobard Italy, she brought into Italy a uh, Bavarian and at the same time Catholic influence. And she was Catholic, she, she exchanged letters with Pope uh, Gregory uh, the Great, she was uh, seemingly an educated woman uh, for considering the standards of you know, Germanic people of the 6th century and sh she chose as um, her future king um, the Duke of Turin um, uh, so in, in, in always within the Long Longobard kingdom who was Agilulf by the way, it's very interesting, the role of women in Longobard history, I will probably talk about that one day. Um, the Longobards were s very strongly Germanic from an ad identitary point of view, and even from Tacitus, um, we know, and Caesar, we know how much women were taken into consideration by the Germans, the ancient Germans. Uh, they believed that they had a you know, spiritual sensibility that they often that was evidently related to this natural world of fertility that the woman symbolizes, etc. So I think it's very interesting in this context to see how, you know, the Longbirds would make choose um, uh, the, the, the widow of, of Authory who the, the next king would have been and, and to let her marry him. Obviously you know, yeah, there is a bit of a romance around this, uh, historiographically speaking, it's obvious that it was the Langobard aristocracy who, who decided to elect Agilulf, but it still seems that Theodolinda had, you know, uh, um, a sort of uh, charisma that probably derived mm, also fr mm, surely from her intelligence and political skill that she, she proved sometimes, but also probably from the fact that the Longobards were still quite sensible to the idea of a woman having a sort of sixth sense, of, you know, trusting her in such important matters like 
and sacral matters maybe in some domain, in some measure, like choosing a, a, a king really was. The, the Longobards had really refused all um, the sacrality in, in, in their monarchy because um, they had no monarchy and, and those w the, the, the aristocrats who, atten who had attempted to build up a dynasty, they had done it through the excuse of you know, of the sacrality of their um, of their lineage. And this is something that the Longbirds were very strongly believers of freedom of the Germanic equality and freedom uh, refused um, at a certain point. This happened in a very obscure age when the Longbirds were still uh, in Germany, so we, we know very few about them. Um, but it, it probably... Uh, it's and, and, and the, Ger uh, the, the Longbird kings would be always elected according to the German ritual, but still, probably, Theodolinda brought back a sort of... Um, of mysticism, or uh, that that still was um, burning under the ashes of Longobard egalitarism um, from from a more or less distant Germanic past, and um, and he married Theodolinda. Uh, Agilulf married Theodolinda as an Arian, meaning that when they got married, um, they they didn't make such a fuss about which confession they had, you know. Um, Agilf rema had remained Arian and Theodolinda had remained Catholic. However, at a certain point, Agilf decides to convert to Catholicism. Also thanks to the, um, uh, his wife and, and the diplomatic relation with the Pope um, of the time. Which was very important because the former um, husband of Theodolinda, Autari, had waged war against Rome itself, against the Pope, even probably with some pagan contempt against the symbol of, 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 of Christianity, like like Rome was. You know, a lot of Romans were even taken prisoners and sent. The sources say in chains as dogs to be sold um, in, in France, um, among the Franks. So very crude and uh, violent acting, even for those times standards. Uh, a lot of people were slaughtered. Agilf at that time was a political turn because he started to establish instead uh, positive relations with Rome, which is a very clever political gain because Rome was still formally part of the Byzantine Empire at the time, but the popes had already gained, at least over the city, a consistent power, and Rome was a very big city in Italy as well, probably the, the biggest city in, in the West at that time, um, indeed. and. Um, by the way, the Longbirds have ruled over other large cities like Verona or Milan or, or mm, Pavia. Um, and uh, this idea of, you know, mm, starting at least to have a, a friendly relationship with popes would mm, uh, mitigate the relationship with the Byzantines because if Rome was completely allied with the Byzantines who were fighting against the Longbirds, that would have been a problem because the Pope would have helped the Byzantines at a point. And the Pope really had a lot of power, political and material power uh, at that time in Italy, so the Byzantines needed uh, him to wage war against the Longobards. So by making friends with the Pope, Agil f probably uh, did a lot in order to, you know, even reduce the Byzantine threat that up to that point had been very, very dangerous for the Longobards. In the, in, in at the end of the 6th century, the, the Longobard kingdom had risked even to be wiped out. Autori did a lot in that sense to preserve it. Um, so, um, Adolf had been and probably remained, I mean, we, we can't really know what was the spiritual faith of of a Longobard king of the um, the beginning of the uh, of the seventh century, um, I think he might have remained a pagan, or maybe he was a Christian really. But in that form of Christianity that we have seen, that is capable of making a commixtion with uh, older pagan beliefs, or maybe he remained um, 
uh, Arian, even after he converted to Catholicism, we, we can't know, but the most important part is that he set, um, you, you know, uh, a first um, uh, a first foreword, first premise <laughs> for saying we as longbirds and uh, of whom I am the king, we convert formally to Catholicism. So we 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 take a very um, clear political direction in Italy, um, and uh, which absolutely didn't mean appeasing the Byzantines, mm -hmm. uh, or maybe even that because. Yeah, I mean, the fact of fighting among Catholics might have been, you know, until the Longbirds were Aryans, the Byzantines might have said, oh, those are even Aryans, so they are not just uh, bloody, ruthless Germanic barbarians who, 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 who conquered our own beloved Italy, about which the Byzantines didn't care b anything about at that time, as they were mostly, you know, from, from non-Italians, at least in uh, from from a political Hierarch hierarchical point of view, um, and you know, even becoming Catholic would mean not doing a favor to the Byzantines, but at least posing themselves as clearly into uh, a frame in which everybody was Catholic. So even that problem was taken away, and by strengthening the um, the um, the um, the um, uh, you know, I don't remember what I was saying, but uh, <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, the idea of, of being part of a block that that was seen as not problematic from a religious point of view, and that granted, obviously, some form of stability. Adolf, however, didn't convert to Catholicism. Um, this is important. I wasn't clear as from from what I said. Um, he wasn't certain. Um, this is what we get, but he made baptize. He had his son baptized, so uh, the son he had with um, with Theodolinda, and and uh, and he um, he granted uh, a donation, w which is very important, to the monastery that had been founded in Bobbio near. Um, uh, near uh, mm, Pavia, mm, which was the Longobard capital at that time, near Placentia, telling the truth, but it's still very close. And and Bobbio was a, an extremely important monastery in, in 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 early medieval history and even later until the Long Middle Ages, since it had been founded by Saint Columbane. And um, and 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 in fact, the Longobards in the court of Agilolf and Tullinda had very friend relationship with St. Columban that uh, migrated, uh, you know, as a missionary from the uh, the British islands uh, into um, into Italy, into Central uh, Europe, and then eventually into Northern Italy. Um, and, uh, and therefore, he, um, uh, he, 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 he became Catholic friendly in many ways. And he even arrived to gift the um the impoverished uh, catholic churches uh by uh, and um re re increasing the 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 prestige of bishops into the uh into the longobard kingdom because this was the paradox that when the longobards had arrived in italy and they, they were arians formally um they had obviously conquered the local catholic churches and obviously these churches would remain catholic I mean, initially, probably, they tried to put some Aryan as bishop of that city, but it couldn't hold. They didn't have the demographical strength to impose to this white Catholic uh, local population their own mm, and very weak um, Aryan faith. So um, it's <laughs> already very weak Aryan faith, as we've seen. Um, so, um, and, and we have to understand these acts of Agilov in favor of the Catholic Church as a very important political um, um, action as well. Um, y you have to think that the, uh, the, Italian, um, uh, the Italian episcopate had been uh, 
um, very seriously devastated by uh, the Longover invasion. Um, this happened for many reasons. Um, there is this stigma on the Longobards as kind of cruel pillagers. Probably, you know, we we don't have any evidence that really lo historical evidence that the Longobards ever massacred the, the areas where they eventually settled in. You know, uh, at least it was frontier warfare against the Byzantine terrorists, uh, territories. Yeah, that they made a lot of mess, but uh, you know that that's what the Byzantines did in turn. So. Uh, you can't excuse them, it was normal warfare as it was w waged uh, anywhere else in the world at that time in the same exact fashion um, which by the way this shows very also a very interesting uh, Langobard ability in, in, in military affairs but besides that there is to say that I objectively when the Langobards arrived uh, in Italy and they conquered these Roman territories Romano-Italic, at least. Um, they, there were certain aristocracies there. They still belong to the late Roman formula of the idea that there is an aristocracy that produces uh, land no landowners and, and, and bishops. And this aristocracy had been enormously weakened, not much by the Longobardic invasion, but very much uh, by the, uh, the greek Gothic War. So it was it had been very easy for the Longobards at a certain point to take out these very few guys that I remained and and you know which was an influence at that point because um, they were so poor that they couldn't impose their pr aristocratic preeminence over the local population. The local population was very poor. Mm, well, probably not so much because Italy still had the greatest um, wealth per capita in the world at that time, but it was the the very old structure that couldn't hold anymore. So this mm, episcopate had been blown blown away by the Langobard invasion in some ways, and yet, um, you know, there was still the idea that on lower bases there were still these Catholic communities uh, with bishops, especially in local and minor. Um, you know, one thing is changing the, bi the Archbishop of Milan, or the Bishop of Milan, which is a very freaking huge city at that time. In, um, and another thing is, you know, changing a bishop in, in another remote, I don't know, alpine area that had no, you know, even no particular strategic meaning. But well, the Alps were important for the Longbirds strategically. But I mean, uh, you know, that bishop break wasn't perhaps that uh, meaningful in from from that point of view. Um, so um, we can't say that th the big bishops had been taken out by the Longbird invasion, and by re-granting certain rights to the Catholics, or at least by r accepting uh, the 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 weren't rights in that sense, in the juridical sense, but by gifting the Catholic monasteries and churches and letting other Catholic bishops being, um, you know, elected in the Episcopate, um, it really showed, you know, a very benevolent attitude, considering how hard it had been blow um, against the, the, uh, the uh, you know, because of the Longobard invasion. However, things had been also a little a bit more complicated in the sense, and this shows probably how the Longbirds weren't at all slaughterers or bullies that arrived and began to, to rule in someone else's house um, uh, for, for the sake of it. Uh, for instance, the metropolitan of Milan, so uh, this very important city that had been uh, even the, um, the capital of the empire at a certain point in, in, in the late uh, medieval, uh, in late Roman times, um, before the Longobards even arrived and set foot in the city, he, uh, uh, he, he, he had already fled. Hmm? He fled wi with all the high clergy of the city and he escaped to Genoa, who was still uh, safely in the hands of the Byzantines and it would remain until the mid of the 7th century. Um, and, and even the Patriarch of Aquileia, who was also a very important um, uh, clergyman and very influent, he fled into the Venetian lagoons on Grado um, 
and um uh and 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 therefore um the uh, uh, there was the need of of even replacing these figures in some way because Longobards arrived and, and probably these metropolites that had fled to the Byzantine territories because they didn't want to fall into the hands of the terrible barbarians and pagans searching a place in, in the Roman world that was declining at that time it was a problem for the Longobards because these bishops had been otherwise quite important for the same uh, uh, local administration um, of in civil matters. So the Longobards were deprived with the uh, with the fleeing of these figures, even of very capable people who would help the local the local church and even solve material problems relatively to the organization of uh, you know the city. Uh, the direction of its supplies the and, and many and the the, um, the maintenance of hospitals or xenodokia for the pilgrims so all problems that longbirds were had to face at that point by themselves so the decline of the the local senatorial um, aristocracy that basically disappeared with the general within the, the first generation of the Longobard invasion was a problem for the Longobards because they they lost some of the best cult and most cultured people at that time that could help them to manage such uh, a developed country like Italy was. This is also a paradox. Italy w had been the center of the empire. Maybe northern Italy was a bit more disconnected compared to central and southern Italy to the Mediterranean trade and, and stuff, but it still was a very advanced uh, area compared to, I don't know, Pannonia, where the Longobards were, had been uh, before coming to Italy, and obviously much more than Germany. Uh, so uh, there was obviously a, a civilization problem. The Longobards weren't weren't capable of managing certain structures and they had to either reinvent part of their um, s managing skills or even to adapt to the very few that that had been left. Um, so why am I saying this? Because with the restoration of the ecclesiastical mm, properties that were however very small, you know, the ecclesiastical properties be before the, the Longobard invasions were very large estates. Um, after the Longobard invasion, you know, those estates had been taken by the Longobard aristocracy. So we're talking about donations that even an, in a poor world like that, like the early medieval one could be in terms of material wealth, were very simple donations. We, we see that even from, you know, documents and other material we have that, you know, there were some in certain cases, uh, maybe much for that time, but still a very few, something that couldn't, um, uh, you know, alter the balance of, of who, you know, of longer birds, uh, you know, mm, domination over those lands, because maybe that those properties could feed a uh, sort of... Mm, sort of uh, a Roman resistance or stuff like that. No, but they were it was still meaningful. Um, and, um, um, and and therefore, um, w what is important in this way, however, is that it was uh, these all these donations that uh, had begun with Theodolinda and all and and favored by by Agilulf and so on, and, and, and from that time onwards also by most of the other Longobard kings, because there would be a very few Aryan kings afterwards, and the Longobard kingdom would have become fully Catholic, especially from uh, the 8th century, there was no doubt whether, you know, the Arianism had been completely forgotten. Um, um, but the, it was very important and clever from the Longobard um, from side because basically it um, um, gave to the clergy that had remained within the Longobard um, uh, kingdom an autonomous uh, ability of action, mm -hmm. which is quite important because yeah, you're ruling uh, a Catholic um, populated um, land like Northern Italy, you need um, these people to 
to still have a contact with with local bishops bishops who can help them pe bishops that can you know interact with them we can organize even in the where you know lo longer bird public rule maybe hadn't already you know structured a firm dominion and especially to establish a more positive relationship with the local population and with these ecclesiastical um, communities um, uh, and clergymen w w had remained even if not at the levels we were talking about the metropolitan of Milan or these very high figures of the former Roman world but you know a sort of what c we can call as a Longobard clergy uh, that was necessary for a, for a Catholic kingdom indeed like the Longobards were were creating their own um, and um, uh, and it was very important also for another reason for the contacts with Rome because um, the local clergy uh, during the Longobard domination never never stopped interacting with Rome and it was even a problem having you know uh, a, a clergy that was faithful to someone who uh, to the Pope I'm referring to that was enemy of the Longobards and it was obviously a source of instability and of weakness to to be Arian in, in a world of Catholics so th this was a very clever move from the Longobards and we have to give them that that it was very difficult for a pagan for what had been a, a largely pagan people up to that point to accept this transformation and to you know set the basis for for something common with the local population that eventually became to be Langobert as well um, from a, from an identitary political point of view and um, and this was also very important um, as we were saying for even st uh, standing against uh, Constantinople when when uh, when it was possible for instance um, with the question of the three chapters that was a very important episode um, that saw the Longobard Kingdom and, and the Pope uh, of Rome standing together against Constantinople. The matter of three chapters is, you know, one of those boring chapters you nobody ever remembers, but it's still important in medieval history. Uh, basically, in, in the sixth century, the Byzantine uh, Emperor Justinian had condemned the thought of three um, bishops and theologians of the previous century so people who had already died but that were still very influent for their ideas um, and we had been quite close to Nestorianism that was seen and it was uh, an heresy against uh, which uh, to fight um, and um, I, 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 I you know I don't go into detail because here it's not important but the important I is that the Byzantines here were sort of um, appeasing with other factions, uh, radical factions that at that time ruled in certain areas of the empire and therefore Constantinople in order to keep them was sort of uh, condemned in these chapters trying to look as if and all pretty schemy things that that weren't really liked by Rome that otherwise was during the early Middle Ages always quite strongly um, orthodox um, and and very very adverse to these uh, you know um, innovations <laughs> let's call them uh, or, or by Constantinople that were that were always redeemed by sudden aftertoes where when the problems were solved often for for <laughs> very different reasons and many bishops um, were rebelled to the um, to this uh, condemnation and um, that had been done by Constantinople and in particular the metropolites of Milan and Aquileia so Longobard uh, metropolites um, promoted a, a schism that was resolved only at the end of the 7th century mm. um, I made it simple but just to make you understand and um, and for for this point of view it's very interesting how the Longobards um, were also following the Roman Church in this matter against Constantinople and were all always in spite of their former her Aryan heresy um, 
and pagan background, they were always um, extremely orthodox from a Catholic point of view. You know, they were always quite faithful to the Nisan doctrine afterwards, and that tells you how serious they actually were relatively to religious matters and international politics from, from, from that point of view. And, and there is also a point that when, uh, at a certain point, um, the uh, Tricapitaline schism uh, came to an end, um, the, uh, the Catholics' um, um, forces within the, the Longobard Kingdom um, were, uh, were kind of uh, um, refueled by all those Byzantines, that um, Byzantine clergy that, that, that was present in Italy and that had been, however, far from, uh, from the Longobard world and the Longobard church uh, and local church, uh, churches um, because of this um, schism that has opposed for eminently political region, uh, uh, reasons uh, these, these two areas. So um, even if maybe there was still some sort of Aryan um, um, re resistance within the Longobard world, with the end of the Tricapitaline schism the Byzantine, um, the Italian Byzantine clergy uh, became all of the sudden obviously uh, in uh, in harmony with the the other um, areas of Italy that had supported the schism and they sent uh, a wave of, um, of, of people um, of clergymen, uh, some of, mm, of which uh, were also of Eastern um, origin and that had operated in Rome and were quite influent people, so people wi with an education and a great theological understanding, uh, basically entered Longobard Kingdom um, at the end of the schism and allowed the um, the the old Aryan um, you know uh, resistance that had formed uh, around certain aristo uh, ar Longobard aristocrats to be basically solved forever. Um, so there was a point in which Longobard Italy benefited from uh, more uh, inc uh, incisively um, from the um, the more orthodox Longobard, uh, more orthodox religious views um, coming from the most intensely Christianized world that basically uh, eradicated any um, form of, of heresy, of what was left of it uh, in the Longobard Kingdom. Um, and um, relatively to Arianism, uh, a last thought that I would like to, to throw in is the idea that, as we have seen, um, the Longobards had been uh, um, Arian very superficially speaking. When you study Longobard history, you find that at a certain point in the seventh century, there was a bit of um, a sort of factionalism within the same Longobard aristocracy that was, at least by name, uh, based on um, on a different view. You know, it was the Catholic party and the Aryan party. And it seems as if, you know, it was a big religious problem. But telling the truth, um, you know, Arianism at that point didn't mean very much. It was just a name. It was just one side that probably supported Arianism, not because they believed in it, but because it represented still the old Longobard traditionalism, as it had always been in the Longobard world. Um, and therefore, uh, a religious side that was always a, p a mere political instrument. Maybe the, those that Aryan party so many more pagans than 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 Aryans in that sense, and people maybe wanted that Longobard Kingdom didn't exist, uh, which is also a very forced um, uh, forced scenario because after Authory, um, the Longobard Kingdom wasn't really ever. Uh, put into question by the Longobards. Not even the Duchies of Spoleto and Benevento said we don't recognize the kingdom. Maybe we want to be independent from it or autonomous from it, but there, there is a, a kingdom like that. 
and 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 however historiographically speaking there's always been this prejudice that Longbird Kingdom was weakened inside and divided inside in factions east and west you know the western area with Milan and Pavia the most Romanized and, ca and Catholic area and the northeast that retain a sort of more of a Germanic background and possibly Aryan when not pagan ideal from a cultural point of view, indeed, it is true, because the East was less populated, probably certain uh, ancient mm, beliefs had remained, while the, the West was the highly urbanized and uh, populated Catholic area. But if you really study Langeberg politics, you see that it's uh, that was just an excuse. There was never a fraction within the kingdom, and when you see these aristocracies divided between the Catholics and the the Aryans and hence uh, between the innovators and the tradi traditionalists, um, it's just a name. They were essentially um, aristocracies that were fighting for becoming king. And and the definitive proof that that wasn't really any uh, any problem for, for the Longobard kingdom and its uh, political unity and integrity is that uh, certain kings uh, that were from the Aryan side at a certain point uh, Senator the nobles were from the Aryan side at a certain point become Catholic when they were in power. So it was just an excuse. It was just a matter of reaching that point. And however, the these are problems that you find only moments in which there is in fact this um, uh, competition for the throne of Pavia. And um, uh, and 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 Longobard Italy um, headed towards a fully Catholic, um, uh, you know, identity. And in the eighth century, you don't find anything like that. You can f still believe that it was a tradition that was still felt as part of Longobard people as a whole, but that was a m a, a more gluing factor than than else. It was the still the idea that it was the Longobard kingdom. And uh, and the fact of being Catholic was a sort of redemption from the ancient pagan world that, however, was still revered and remembered, as it proves the um, the um, the work of Paul the Diacon, who was a uh, very uh, a very fervent Catholic, but and obviously condemned the um, the 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 ancient uh, Germanic myths as fabule, that is tales or or stuff like that, but that still remembered them and still gave them a great importance into his work to deter to show who the Longobards had been and who still were at the core, um, enriched by their uh, Christian conversion and and therefore by it is uh, something that was added to their original um, glorious past from from that point of view. And um, and and the full Christianization and ca um, of of the Longobards happens uh, in the mid of the seventh century, um, in which um, and it's perfectly shown by archaeology because when the Longobards were still pagan, they buried uh, their men and sometimes even their women with weapons, mm? weaponry, uh, even with their own horses, because the Longobards were very very good horsemen, at least when they came into Italy, then they became a bit more sedentary and they didn't develop a feudal system with heavy cavalry like the Franks, but that was an exception. That This is something that happened to all the other Germanic peoples, even to the same Franks in certain measure, even though the Franks originally didn't have uh, in the western uh, forests of Germany very strong cavalry. Um, however, in the mid of the 7th century, what you find is that the Longbirds start to bury people um, without any um, earthly good, without weapons. And at that point, you understand that Christianization was complete. Um, and it's sad, because uh, bec exactly because of that, for instance, uh, relatively to military history, we don't know... Um, how the Longbirds were equipped uh, from that time onwards, because there are such f a few sources about that period that uh, the last weapons we have are f from the seventh century. We don't know, for instance, at the time of Charlemagne when they fought against the Franks, uh, what kind of weaponry they used. 
no evidence whatsoever. So it's kind of sad, but at, at the same time, if you look at it in a bigger picture, in a broader picture, it's still very me it's very meaningful. It's something that m uh, makes you understand sh and sheds uh, light on on a lot of aspects of Longbird culture and their progressive Christianization. So I hope you like this video. I've been talking quite a lot. I, it's a topic that I highly like. Uh, and I hope I was I was clear. Um, if, if you have any question, please uh, write in, in the comment or send me an email. If you like this video, sh please share it. It's really the biggest uh, favor you can do to me. Otherwise, leave a like or subscribe to my channel to receive other news about my contents. And um <laughs> And thanks for watching, really, and um, I wish you a nice time, and see you next time. Bye.